If you've seen, uh, we're going to go into Matthew chapter 10 today. Um, we do find ourselves in week two of our five-week discipleship series together. It's called um, In the Making. Hopefully you've all seen the really high level of production in Sunday school. Yeah, good job. Um, but our hope is trying, or our hope is for this church to try to return to this good sense that um, God really does intend to make or form us into something. It's really God's intention. Um, and so last week, we invited you to kind of take ownership of that. Uh, with Carla, we looked at what it is that God or that Christ called the first disciples, um, asked them ultimately to confess and to claim their discipleship, to, to physically get up and follow after him. Uh, and so, we're, again, we're asking one another to own, to take ownership, to own whether or not we really do consider ourselves disciples. That's a fair question. You know, it's one of those things we take for granted in the American South. We have to ask ourselves to own that or to own the fact that we really aren't disciples because that's okay because to own it might give us a chance to actually start being one for the first time. We need to own it one way or the other. So that was last week. Uh, this week we arrived um, at the very next step in discipleship, which is, uh, to me, the daily decision to keep following Jesus. Okay? Um, and it's the place where I think most of us kind of stall out as disciples. It's, it's somewhere between that first big yes or that big series of yeses that we said to Christ when we first became disciples. Somewhere between there and the next dozen or hundred or thousand yeses that he seems to, to ask of us. We find ourselves there. We, we, we follow him down that road a little bit, but guaranteed somewhere down that road, Jesus is going to say or do or ask something that is going to make us want to kind of slow down in our tracks a little bit uh, and make us maybe uh, say, hey, you guys, you and the crowd, y'all go on ahead a little bit. And we let them get on ahead and say, Jesus, go and get a few towns ahead, get a few miles ahead. Sometimes it's that we see something along the roadside as we follow him that draws our attention. And we slow down in our tracks a little bit. Uh, sometimes ultimately we say, I'd rather, it might feel better to just go back to Galilee and go back to the fish. Okay? And so we, the question is how we continue to kind of stay in step with the Lord. How do we kind of keep up and, and walk still beside him? Uh, the word again that sums all that up is obedience. Uh, being in the making as a disciple has to involve obedience. And if we taught, if you were here, were you here with us two weeks ago? It's a big holiday. What's the holiday? Okay, we well, were here for y'all. Come on now. Did we participate in Valentine's Day? Did y'all buy things and get things? Good. Let's have some bigger with that. Valentine's Day. They have love. And so we wrestled together. Um, yeah, we wrestled together with. How obedience shows up in relationships. We admitted together, if you remember, that obedience is really hard for us to wrap our heads around. Especially obedience to God. Because it's really hard to find in human relationships a good example of, of healthy obedience. Amen? We talked about the fact that when it comes to other people, other humans, even our closest, most intimate connections, our spouses, our children, our parents, sometimes we're just wrong as human beings. And we have the wrong expectations. And so blanket obedience. We were moved to obey from the marriage vows a few years ago. Because blanket obedience can, can go wrong. Think about some of the worst ways. That's the best ways. Think about some of the worst ways that obedience can go wrong. Okay. Obedience at its worst, how do we breed that in each other? Through fear? Through coercion? Through control? Through manipulation? I imagine, you know, like child soldiers in Africa who've been desensitized and indoctrinated into being obedient little soldiers at a very young age uh, by being forced to do horrible things, that indoctrination. Yeah, I imagine, uh, again, households that are toxic or abusive. Okay, we see at its worst how that can go. Think about how the people of God have gotten it just very wrong, the worst cases in history. Okay, as we think about the Pharisees, right? Folks that helped put Jesus to death. Like as we think about uh, the Crusades, uh, the Inquisition, uh, you know what I'm saying? Legalistic fundamentalism, especially in this country. As we think about uh, things like the Jonestown Massacre, are we old enough to 
you need to look up some stuff about the Jonestown Massacre. Um, because that stuff goes on. Kind of cult-like situations where, kind of again, blanket human obedience goes horribly wrong. Because, again, we all find ourselves under the human condition. We're human beings. Um, I think we also have a hard time as a culture dealing with obedience, talking about it, because we just we reject it in a lot of ways. And so, like, my peer group, I think I'm kind of a millennial. My mom says maybe Gen X. I don't even know what those things mean exactly. Um, but my peer group, the millennials and younger, we especially take a look at all that history and, and all that stuff. And, and it's kind of a statistical fact that we mistrust, we, we have a, a big distrust for institutions and systems, especially like the church. Because we've seen the harm that's come. And we say things to ourselves, we've concluded to ourselves uh, things like, don't drink the Kool-Aid, right? Straight up. Don't be taken in. Uh, question everything. Preserve your freedom at all costs. Don't let anybody brainwash you. And lots of times we apply those feelings to, to church, amongst other things. And culturally, I think the downside is that as a culture, in the face of all that, we've come to a pretty, a pretty hairy conclusion. Um, and that's that the only person, the one person that I can ultimately trust to always obey is myself. Right? When it comes to determining what's right or wrong and what's good or bad in my personal direction, it's all personal and it's all about what I think for me. Yes? The only real person I can trust to obey is me. And I think that can, that can work out in some ways. I don't know that we're going to have another inquisition anytime soon, and I hope we don't, in part because we're so self-determined. But what's the downside to only obeying me? Except that I am also a human being. And myself is also living under the human condition. Anybody? Amen? Yes? And if I think we think obeying just ourselves is going to solve everything, then big newsflash, how has that gone for me so far in life? And reality is, when I think about it, and agree or disagree, myself can be a huge idiot. Okay? Myself can be a huge idiot. And immoral and self-centered and ridiculous and just completely off base. And so as much as our, our, our culture says question everything, uh, we also need to question our culture. We also need to question our self as the master of all things. Ultimately, what do we do? As Christian people, Christian teaching is really clear. The Christian faith tells us that the only hope that we have is if we are guided by something or rather someone that lives outside of all this broken human system. Okay? We really need something, or rather someone, who has a good sense for who we were meant to be before the fall. All the glory and perfection that God meant for us before the fall. And where are we going to find somebody like that? Okay, no, I'm mumbling it. His name is Jesus. We don't have to find him. He came to find us. He came to find us and to tell us that. And to know us and to be known by us. And to call us and to invite us to follow him. Because he knows that the only way we can ever be our truest selves or truly free is to listen to no one above him. And it is mind-blowing. It's totally counterintuitive. It makes no sense to think that the only way we can be truly free and truly ourselves is to, in some way, give ourselves over to someone else. That makes no sense, particularly in our culture. But if there's a perfect person who can do that, it's our only shot. It's our only shot to break out of the prison, the oppression of obeying only ourselves. It's exactly what we start to see in Matthew chapter 10. Uh, we've got a great glimpse of that in verses 5 through 15. And this is really the next step in the Gospel of Matthew when it comes to discipleship. So the disciples have only recently been called by name in the book of Matthew. The very next step is in chapter 10, verse 5. It says, uh, these 12, 
If you start in, in verse 1, he's going to name all the disciples. I don't want to read through that because it's, y'all know those names. It's crazy. And, you know, there's 12 of them and they're hard to pronounce. We're going to move on. Y'all know there's 12 disciples, right? And it's like Bartholomew and there's Zebedee stuff in there. It's, we're going to move on. Um, but verse 5, he's just named the 12. And it says, These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. It says, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You receive without payment, now give without payment. Take no gold or silver, no copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, not two tunics, no sandals, and no staff, for laborers deserve their food. But whatever town or village you enter, find out who in, it, who in it is worthy and stay there with them until you leave. As you enter their house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet as you leave that house or town. And truly I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. So it's, it's an interesting one. It's, it's ultimately a, a good example of Christ getting ready to send the disciples out with, with big instructions, with really specific instructions. And it's important for us, I think, because it's the first, first situation in the gospel again where the disciples, after having decided to follow Jesus, are being really put on the spot to say yes in a big way again. Um, they're going to be sent out to do this, this wild stuff. And I think it's really cool, it's really important for us uh, because this passage reveals to us that obedience, obedience, Christian obedience, is always a multiple choice proposition. It is always a multiple choice question. Um, in other words, uh, when Jesus asks us to follow Him, we are always going to have to choose Him and that following over some other alternatives. Amen? If not just staying with the nets, there are probably countless alternatives. Uh, and we see that here. Uh, in Matthew chapter 10, he is challenging, I think, two of the biggest alternatives to his way that we all wrestle with as disciples. We need to wrestle with it today. Two of the biggest alternatives to him. And the first is this. The first thing that Jesus is asking the disciples to obey in him rather than this, is the, the desire to let somebody else take care of everything. Okay? I think the first big desire, the first biggest alternative to following Christ, to real obedience, is the desire to let somebody else take care of everything. What am I talking about? So, for instance, where we are in the story, if we put ourselves in the disciples' shoes, um, it has been a pretty sweet deal up until now. Yeah? We said yes, we started to follow. We've been like the Jesus tag-alongs. We've gotten to see him do all the fireworks, do all the awesome stuff. And we've gotten to just kind of be in awe along with everybody else. Okay? Uh, we've had a chance to um, be spectators with almost ultimately front row seats because we are his closest companions. Not only that, but I assume at this point we've started to gain a little bit of secondhand attention for ourselves, right? Everywhere he goes, who's there? We are. Okay, so like if this is uh, Jesus' boy band, and Jesus is that lead, yes, yeah, for real. And Jesus is this lead singer that everybody is swooning over, right? He healed my grandma. He raised Lazarus from the dead. He took away my pneumonia. You know, we are falling all over Jesus. The guys in the back start to get a little secondary attention, right? I mean, there's the bad boy. There's Judas. <laughs> There's the one with the good hair, Daniel. There's the cute one, Bartholomew. There's the other cute one, right? I mean, straight up. We're Jesus' disciples. It's awesome to just be the backdrop. And to be kind of like part of the groupies. And Jesus won't let that last forever. And he interrupts that with this mission in chapter 10. As he says, hey guys, now it's time for you to go. And I'm not coming with you. And it's like, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. 
And not only that, but you're going to be asked to do the exact same things that I've been doing to carry this mission forward, but at the same quality level as me. And you're going to scatter across the countryside to do this without me. And somebody in that group flipped out, if not all of them. But we don't hear their, their, their protests. We don't hear him uh, leverage them or manipulate them or coerce them. We don't even hear him offer them reward. It's just, here are your instructions, and go do it if you will. And we know that they do. And it's a big deal because it starts to establish them, I guess, as their, their own people in Christ. It's a big deal. Um, if you don't know the word apostles, the 12 apostles, the word apostles, we don't have a better English word for that because it literally means the sent out ones. It's the verb that Jesus used. I'm going to send you out. I'm going to apostle you out. And they became known as that. Why? Because they did it. What I'm saying is, by Jesus challenging their desire to hang back and let him take care of everything, it gave them identity forever. And they were named in the first few verses before this passage. That's first and foremost. This is big for us, because how many of us don't obey because we don't think we can? Because we don't want to? Ultimately, because we think someone else will do it. There were 12 other guys, 11 other guys found Peter. Somebody's going to take care of this. There's no way God's going to let this whole thing rest on me. There's no way God's going to give me that kind of responsibility. I don't want that kind of responsibility. We look around and we say there are 200 other people. Or there are 2,800 at Shannon. Or there are 4 billion Christians on earth. God can get this thing done without me. There are people who are paid to do it. I'm just going to give them the offering plate and... We'll pay Josh, and that's all good. And the band, and all good, right? Come on. That's the biggest obstacle to obedience, probably. The idea that somebody else will do it, or Jesus will just get it done himself. And it brings us to the second big desire that I think Jesus challenges towards proper obedience. And it's really the exact opposite. It's the desire to handle everything ourselves. Because why else does Jesus give such specific instructions? Why else ask these folks to bring nothing with them except to try to teach them to trust and to depend a little bit? Okay, so for instance, uh, back in 2008, uh, my wife and I were a few months out from being married. They okay, were about to get married in March. Um, and her brother uh, wanted to get married first. So good job, older brother. Um, and so they wanted to do that. He and his wife, his fiance, wanted to get married in Egypt. Okay, thank you. That's okay. Um, they were world travelers. They lived in Cambodia at the time. That was their thing. And so we were going to spend two weeks during Chinese New Year to go to Egypt for them to get married. Okay. And so like 25 of us went. Um, my wife's family was all very German. Um, and so that's just a side note. It made the trip very special, um, very OCD, and it was, it was fun. Um, <laughs> sorry, uh, not beneficial to the day at all. Um, my point is that on that trip, prior to that trip, I bought a brand new big hiking backpack because I needed one. And I just said, hey, I'll pack everything I own, as they told us to, because Egypt is kind of a crazy climate. Um, everything I own in this backpack for 12 days and good to go. And my pack got lost by Air France. Just throw that out there, Air France. <laughs> my pack was lost with everything in it. And so here I am a few months from marrying my wife. And for the remainder of the next 10 days, I had to wear my father, future father-in-law's underwear. <laughs> every, every guy on the trip and some of the ladies contributed to the Josh clothing line. And so just wore stuff for like five days straight. It was hideous, terrible. And wearing my father-in-law's underwear is real weird. Um, but it honestly, ultimately, honestly, made for a pretty awesome community. And it really was like a daily ritual to go knock on the door and be like, you got some pants for me today. <laughs> like, completely humbling and depending and all of the above. And that kind of thing, that kind of traveling light, it fosters that kind of community and dependence and, and humility and trust. And it forms relationship. And I really do feel like that's kind of similar to what Jesus' goal was by sending the disciples out packing very light about trusting each other and trusting him and being able to get rid of this obstacle to obedience which is to just white knuckle life to death 
Because uh, we cannot hear Jesus. We cannot hear him if we are busy trying to be him completely, to take his place. As much as Jesus sends us off to be just like him, to fulfill his mission, and to empower us and honor us with that, we are not him. And we can't be. And it really hinders our obedience when we feel like we are the masters of our lives. And we have a hard time giving that over to someone else. To trust that. And that's what Matthew 10 is all about. The question before us as we close is just, again, are we disciples? And if yes, if we've said yes in a big way, are we still saying yes? Or have we slowed down somewhere along the way? Or gotten distracted by something else along the path? Or gone all the way back to the nets? We kind of said, Jesus, love you. See you in heaven. I got the rest of this 30, 40, 10, 5 years. Those are the obstacles to obedience. And so those of us, again, like I told the children, who say, well, you know, Josh, I would be more obedient if I would get such clear instructions from Christ, right? If Jesus said, do this, go there, don't take that, I would do it. The truth is, again, if we practice not listening to him, how can we expect to hear him clearly when he does give us clear instructions? I really feel like obedience sustains itself. The more we are obedient, the more easily we hear his voice and recognize him. Instead of saying, hush, Jesus, I got this, this is my time, you do that, I'll do this. We tell Jesus to hush a hundred times a day. When it comes to the big decision, we're like, Jesus, what do you think? How are we going to even recognize his voice? How on earth will we recognize his voice? <coughs> so here we are together. It's, it's big. Here in week two, well, I think this is really right where most of us live as disciples. So we need to really dig into a healthy understanding, a holy understanding of Christian obedience. Amen? Let us pray. Well, Jesus, again, uh, we can find great ways to bail out and follow you. We, gosh, you challenge us. Some of the most difficult and awesome and powerful and scary things on earth come from your mouth to us, from your call to us. Even as you're trying to honor us and, and equip us to do things just like you and to carry your magnificent mission forward, it is overwhelming to us sometimes and so we bail out we, maybe we don't always say no but we stop saying yes or eventually we do start to say no we ask you to hush we ask you to go to your corner and we'll go to ours and we get numb to your voice we harden our hearts and it's hard to hear you when we want to so Lord for all of us who had that sense of disconnect from you what I pray for it is that in obedience we might reconnect again not that we can earn your favor and not that we earn your, this relationship by doing the right things. But because we know you already love us and because you love us, why would we not act to follow you and to do as you do and to bless others like you do? So we just, we really pray for your help in this. Uh, teach us in it, even today, what it means to, to hear you and to follow moment by moment. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.